If you're watching this video, you're probably not getting into investment banking. Just kidding. We don't know you. But what we can tell you is that our program has helped over 800 plus students break into the field of investment banking. 60% of which come from non-target schools. And all of that for a hefty price of $7,000 a month, we can help you break in too. Psych! We ain't no mastermind program. We give that information for free because we are the Ski Mass Proskies. Talk about loyalty. You want to ride with me? Run to the bank. We just hit the lottery. We scoping bank. We working on pottery. Copy. Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Um, we appreciate all the love and support you guys have been giving us over the past couple of days, especially the Wall Street Oasis boys, throwing the bananas left and right. Our potassium's at all time high. Went to the freaking monkey doctor earlier today. He said we gotta diversify our fruits. He said we gotta eat some more watermelons. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Next time we're gonna have a freaking uh, you know, salad party, all right? And you guys better bring more than bananas. <laughs> what the fuck you can say, bro? <laughs> Uh, let's run it back. Today we're gonna to be covering how to break into investment banking from a non-target school. Yeah, and for some background, both of us graduated from non-target schools. And like many of you guys, we've been a part of this sort of super accelerated recruiting process for summer annals positions like back in our early sophomore years. And honestly, like we know how frustrating and stressful and you know sad it could be sometimes, you know, like when it's April and you're in the middle of your recruiting process and you, mm -hmm. you know, like you don't know if you're going to land an offer or not. But that's the reason why we sort of wanted to make this video because we felt like we've deployed some techniques that were helped us, that helped us like become relatively successful yeah. in recruiting. And we were fortunate enough to convert summer analysts and both of us at Bulge Bracket Banks. Bro, let's cap. You did not work at a Bulge Bracket. What were you talking about, bro? I worked at a full series investment bank. Yeah. Well, that's still not a Bulge Bracket. What are you talking about? <laughs> It, it ain't a middle market though, bro. What the fuck? Come mm -hmm. on, man. Come on. RBC, Wells Fargo, Mizuho, MUFG, now Credit Suisse. Bro, they, those, those are rose brackets. But anyways, like I was saying, we were both fortunate enough to secure banking offers for our junior summers back in undergrad. And honestly, you know, like reflecting back on that experience, we've, you know, it was hard, you know, it was a grind. It was primarily given the fact that we didn't have any like OCR, any OCIs, like, on campus recruiting events, on campus interviews. We didn't really have any like direct pipelines that sort of sent us to certain banks. And at the time, like our alumni networks were the far and few in between. Like, we didn't really have a base of people that we could reach out to at every single bank. Yeah. Uh, but with that said, now that we've successfully broke into the industry and work at some, some of these you know, coveted firms. We now you know, are on the other side of the table reviewing piles of resumes, networking, um, having these chats with these freshmen and sophomores trying to learn more about our firm and groups. We really want to provide you guys with the blueprint to be successful in breaking into investment banking from a non-core school that we wish we had when we were an undergrad. Hey. The first thing you gotta focus on um, in terms of building your foundation and being competitive to get an uh, internship within investment banking is your GPA. Now, ideally, you really want it to be 3.7. Um, sometimes it could be you know, 3.5 and maybe lower depending on the major um, and the school that you're at, but ideally you want to be pushing 3.7 if not higher. Yeah, and you know, in certain situations, like we realize that, you know, like being from non-target schools and stuff, like sometimes you have a lot of like family situations that are going on in the background and maybe you know your gpa might dip below like a three five and you know I, I think like there's certain things that you guys could do to make up for that right like the way that you guys should conceptualize the investment bank recruiting process is that similar to like a college application process right mm -hmm. like there's a like, multiple tenants that you need to be good at right if you're weaker on one thing you need to heavily make up on the other right so yeah. people can see the value that at the end of the day you know like you're still hard working despite like academics being you know, on paper a little bit weaker and then the rest or like whatever stack of resumes that they're yeah. looking at. And you know, I think like the second thing in addition to GPA is your extracurricular involvement in mm -hmm. college, right? I think like the moment you step on campus your freshman year, or if you're a sophomore right now, right, you should be very proactive in terms of joining different organizations and different clubs on campus, right? Primarily because it shows like recruiters and also like people like us who lead like sort of non-core recruiting like your ability to ultimately take leadership within an organization by like, you know, like being just active in an organization as mm -hmm. well as 
your ability to work on teams right? and work yeah. with other people effectively, right? Like around your age and stuff like that. Because at the end of the day, like when you go into banking, you're mm -hmm. going to be part of a bullpen and, you know, we yeah. want pleasant people to work yeah. around. And being able to, you know, work on a team and be collaborative and communicate effectively are some of the key, you know, soft skills that we care about within banking. Yes, yes. And, you know, like in addition to like extracurriculars and organizations, right? Like if you're from a non to a school specifically, like ideally you would want to be part of a finance organization, yeah. right? Like I think like this shows, right? Like that one, you guys have an interest in finance when you're interviewing. Mm -hmm. And also like two, like it gives, you know, like it gives you the ability to sort of surround yourself with like-minded people, right? Especially a lot of non-core schools like Rutgers and stuff like that. Like these are large educational institutions with like multidisciplinary stuff, right? Yeah. So it's like you would ideally want to surround yourself with, you know, people who want to go into finance, people who want to break into front office, break into yeah. investment banking, like people that are on the junior and senior ranks that can sort of guide you through. Mm -hmm. And also, like when you're prepping for technicals and stuff like that, right? That, like, I'm going to be honest, right? I don't think our classes really cover yeah. like your yeah. 400 Definitely questions. Not. Yeah. So it's like you guys need sort of like a club that helps you introduce you yeah. to specific like banking type concepts mm -hmm. that you guys could then utilize to like build yeah. a very strong yeah. foundation and then you prep for technical on top of that. Yeah. And you know, like I think like some, some non-target schools with like clubs, it's like Penn State with like their Natty Lion, Lion Fund, Fund or yeah. like Lever Lion Fund or something. Yeah. And like like uh, I think Fordham with their like alternative. What, what do you call it? Investment analysis group or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah, like the, yeah, like, yeah. I, I think that's NYU. Oh, oh my bad. I think it's my alternate in, investment bad. society. Like, like yeah. excuses if we butcher this, but you know, like these yeah. are just the things that we're hearing that are going around. But I think like yeah. Baruch, they have the fifty-five capital. You know. Yeah, yeah. I think, and then the the investment group, investment management group, or something like that. Yeah, and then you got the you know. Always got the Rutgers libors, you know, little bankers on Wall Street, you know, <laughs> running around. And then, you know, the Indiana Investment Banking Workshop, you know. Yeah. So, like, the things about these clubs is that, like, you know, like, even if you're from a non-target school, there's certain clubs within those schools that place very well on the street with, like, yeah. high amounts of, like, alumni representation. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, like, these clubs aren't going to, like, make you get into investment banking, but they sure make it easier because, one, like, you know, it's self-selecting, really. Like, they yeah. give you mentors to guide you. And at the same time, like they have an alumni base for you to reach out to, and you, you know, like from yeah. our experience, like non-target schools, and like, we grind so hard to get into banking. Mm -hmm. And once we get in, we tend to like gatekeep a little yeah, bit. Exactly. We're like, oh, like you know, I work so hard to get in. If you don't work you're hard, not you're not getting. Get and like, that's like a mentality that we see at like non-target schools that you know it like, might not be present at target yeah. schools. <laughs> But that's why, like, you know, you need to work hard and get into these clubs so you can sort of, like, open up a barrier to, like, mm -hmm. meet these people. And hopefully, you know, you can find a mentor that's going to help you through. Yeah, yeah. In addition to extracurriculars and GPA, I think you really have to bolster up your internship experience and work experiences as it pertains to finance and banking, right? And so if you're, you know, a student in a major city like New York, L.A., San Francisco, certain parts of Texas... You know, in Chicago, there typically tends to be regional and invest and boutique investment banks that you could find, you know, spring, fall, summer internships at that could help you, you know, leverage that experience to break into one of these bulge bracket, you know, upper middle market, elite boutique investment banks that you want to have a summer internship at your junior year summer. Um, but yeah, like, you know, I think part of that process is really trying to figure out sort of, you know, what is available locally leveraging kind of the network and figuring out like have there been boutique internships um you know available to certain you know students at your school that you know a colleague of yours like you know intern at this firm like maybe you could reach out to them and always always you know take an internship at a boutique investment bank even if it's unpaid because the experience will help you you know very very far when it comes to you know pitching your interest in yes. breaking into banking yeah, yeah, and and you know like like I, I guess we might be a little bit old school for this, and but you know like most of the times that you see like target school kids like they come in with like one internship experience, it's not related to finance, and then they're a part of like a humanitarian club in your school, you know like we see those resumes in the resume stack a lot, and it's like you know like like you know that that's just the name of the game, yeah. right? Like they're from a place with pedigree, right? That's historically respected, which is fine, right? Like diversity of thought is what makes the workplace, you know, like. Yeah transformative what makes it good and what carries it forward right but at the end of the day like if you're a non-target student you need something that's going to make you stand out mm -hmm. and from our personal experiences i think like we've each like how many internships did you do when you were in undergrad 
Or like six. You total. did six? Yeah. Damn. Well, yeah, so like he did six, I did five. I think we I took like one semester off and that was like the senior the, like the second semester of my senior year. Yeah. It was that year. I don't know, I didn't even take time out at all. Yeah. I have worked every single semester. Yeah. So yeah. it's like we basically like we were fortunate enough to be from, you know, like a metropolitan city. Right. Like yeah. a metro area which is saturated with like boutique investment banks that we yeah. just one of like small private equity shops that we sort of just took internships year after mm-hmm. year. And I think yeah. you were a little bit luckier than I was, but I was doing like sort of like unpaid internships and stuff like that, right? And like the the point is you just gotta stack them up, right? Yeah. Like let's say like obviously like you're probably not gonna get an investment banking boutique offer right off the bat. And I think like for me, you know, I got like a private wealth management internship like my freshman year yeah. and I sort of levered it into like like the this sort of like news financial news thing. Right, and afterwards, I you know like I joined my student investment fund, and I leveraged you know like that experience to get into like boutique investment bank, and yeah. then you know like that's when my talking points for interviews came through, right? And it's just like sort of just like building on your resume each semester in order to yeah. make it as best that it could be, so that yeah. you know like, it could position you well against your competition. Yeah, and back to our, our point about you know painting a story, right? You know, when they ask you why investment bank, you know, why do you want to work at the firm, like. You know, I think having that internship resume and you know, experience coupled with your leadership on campus really provides the soft skills and technical experience to really you know, let the interviewer or the person you're networking know that like, okay, he or she knows what they're walking themselves into and understands what the role that they're signing up for. Because I think a lot of people just, you know, you know, they come freshman, sophomore year, you know, hear about investment banking. Oh, it's like really cool and want to break in, but don't realize like the steps that it takes to get in. And so, you know, we're here to offer our advice and kind of our, you know, process um, based on our experiences. And, you know, in addition to kind of your internships, like you really also, you know, I think from our perspective, we, you know, tend to look at interests, you know, because I think like ultimately we, we want to know whether they're gonna pass the elevator test or the helicopter test, right? If, you know, we're sitting at the airport for, you know, layover um, for 10 hours, can I just shoot the shit with you, right? Like, does this guy like play sports or, you know, knows anything about like music, hip hop? Like, I wanna get to learn about you, right? Because ultimately, you know, you're gonna work in these teams for long projects, you know, sell sides for, you know, year plus or buy sides. And, you know, you're gonna be working in tight knit groups and, you know, you want to get along with the people. And so ultimately, you know, as interviewers and people who could be your potential colleagues, we want to, you know, know who you are as a person. What are you doing on the weekends? Like, what hobbies do you have? And so, you know, highlighting that in your interest section is important. Now, on top of everything else that we've discussed, Mm -hmm. the most important component that's beyond your internship, beyond your extracurricular activities, that's beyond your GPA, that can most of the time overcompensate for everything and defy all odds that we've yeah. had is your ability to network. Exactly. Networking, networking. The importance of networking, you know, really has to begin from, you know, your freshman, sophomore year, whatever you figure out and learn about investment banking, right? Um, you know, typically the investment banking process and summer analyst program you know, starts you know, the application starts about a year and two months before. So around this time, maybe like, you know, February, the application opens for like, you know, dumb banks like RBC. Um, but you know, like you have to be networking six months before the application or when you know the application timeline will begin because you need to build those relationships organically, right? Um, a lot of times people think about networking like, oh, like I gotta reach out to this person, tell him like how much I love his job, his or her job, and then, you know, leverage them to, can I put your name down as a referral? Like, no, that's not efficient, right? And, and also it's not genuine, right? But I think this is the way that we've, you know, have been successful with networking and made it more natural and genuine is really building those relationships, you know, six months in advance. And with those conversations, it's like, you know, after having that first conversation with an associate or a VP from some different, some bank, you know, they give you some guidelines, you know, guidance, like, hey, like you should read this, you should read that, or start continuing to follow deals. And so on a quarter to quarter basis, you could follow up with them, be like, thank you for your you know, advice. And here's what I've learned, or here's, you know, here's the internship I've been, you know, working on. Or, I, I got an internship at a boutique investment bank, really excited to, you know, 
start this and you know launch my career in finance da, 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 da. i think like you know keeping up with your network and letting them know about your progress and how their personal advice to you has impacted how you're improving your you know process and you know journey to break into investment banking because people love it when you actually take the advice and act upon it right and so that makes them feel like oh this person like really cared about the conversation we had and sh you know proves that he or she is like you know is about what they want to do right and so you know that's like one important aspect of networking that i think most people do not talk you know too much about but being on our side of the shoes now like when we provide people with advice and you know we they show us that you know they do what you know we tell them to do like we really appreciate that right yeah. um and so in addition to that it's really you know sure there's an aspect of quality over quantity right like if you have a really good relationship with a senior managing director that might get you through you know the pipeline but at the same time you know being coming from a non-target school you probably don't have you know alumni at every single bank that you are targeting and so you know from a quantity perspective you know when we were doing it we were sending emails out maybe you know 20 30 emails out per week and accumulating that over you know a six month time frame um you know that's basically hundreds and hundreds of emails and of course the hit rate may not be you know 30 percent uh it might be closer to five to ten percent but really really focusing in on yeah. those hundred bankers and those conversations that you have and from that you know, once you built a decent relationship with one or a few bankers, you know, leveraging them to learn more about, you know, asking them at the end of the conversation, like, hey, can you introduce me to someone else in your group or someone else at the firm? Or maybe they have buddies in the industry as well. I think nine out of 10 times, most people are willing to help. And the worst thing they could say is no, right? And so, yeah. you know, you really just have to be, you know, humble and gritty um, and, Based on our, our experiences, you know, people have always met us halfway and were, you know, willing to, you know, reach their hand out and give us an opportunity. Yeah. And like, we're probably going to get a lot of monkey shit for this, but adding on to what you said, right? Like, at the end of the day, like, networking for non-target schools, especially if you're trying to, like, break in, right? Like, people are always like, oh, networking is like a two-sided street, right? You can add, you can give them something if you give you something, right? That's bullshit, right? You can't really give them anything. Yeah. But <laughs> right? at the end of the day, like, there's just... Everyone knows, right? Like the person who you're networking with, he's looking for a candidate to refer and to bring into their organization and you're trying yeah. to get a job, right? So at the end of the day, you gotta treat this like a sales pitch, mm -hmm. right? Like a sales tactic, right? You just, like, you gotta have both quality, but at the same time, you need to have a lot of quantity, right? And a lot mm -hmm. of people say, oh, like, you know, you can't just reach out to like 50 people at once, like blast them, right? That's uh, like, like, honestly, that's, yeah. that's, that's our tip. Right, just blast as many as people, many yeah. people as you can. And You're follow up, follow yeah. up. Yeah, know? just follow up. Like let's say, like if they don't respond two weeks later, set a time for follow up on that email, right? And you know, eventually, like they might never respond. You know, but the one or two people from each bank that's going to respond to you, like one day, right? You open up the door to have a conversation with yeah. them, right? And maybe it's a bad conversation. It's fine, right? You get over it. On to the next, right? Like no one really cares. No one remembers, right? And then, but if you have a good conversation, you ask them, hey, like, can you push my resume in, right? Or can yeah. you refer my resume, like, or can you introduce me to another member of your team? Mm -hmm. And then that way, you know, you, you travel through the whole group, right? And then, you know, like when recruiting season, like, season comes and they open up your portals, you maximize your opportunity of getting a higher view, getting first round and stuff like that. Yeah, and the importance of like following up with people, right? A lot of times it's like, you know, you constantly have to think about it in the sense that you want to be the first person that's in their inbox, right? When they type your name in and, you know, your, your name comes up, like they're <laughs> typing it on Outlook and like, oh shit, I spoke to this dude like six times, right? We had, you know, email traces, you know, back to like when he was a freshman and he's been yeah. crushing it since, you know, we are chatting and he seems like he's doing well, high performer, super active on campus. Let's get him in, you yeah. know, into the pipeline. And so, you know, it's very important to not only network, but also be proactive in updating your network um, because ultimately that will give you the best ROI and chances to get into the firm that you want to be at. Yeah. And like from our experience, right? Like higher views suck, right? Yeah. Like when we were doing it, it sucks. When we were, we're viewing higher views, right? I've reviewed like probably like over 90 yeah. higher views. It sucks too, <laughs> right? Because like, you know, like both of you know it's awkward, right? But at the end of the day, like, if you've networked with someone before, they'll literally ping the team and they'll be like, hey, I had talked to like, let's say Kevin before, right? And like, I like Kevin, 
And I'll be like, okay, fine, yeah, I'll, I'll let him through even though it's higher you sucked ass. Yeah. Right? It's like then, like, boom, right? You get a first round phone interview, and that's when you even the playing field, right? Yeah. You have an equal opportunity as every one of those target schools, everyone else, because you have a chance to compete for the opportunity. Yeah. Right? And at the end of the day, like, that's what matters, yeah. right? To maximize your odds. Yeah. Okay, so, with that said, you know, I know we've rambled a bit, but like, hopefully, we've provided you guys with some useful information and qualitative advice. Right? And going forward, we're actually going to publish some videos, right, regarding how to network and how to use a networking log, right? We plan to help you guys build it live. Yeah. Not live, but like recording a video and sort of like giving you guys the file as well to teach you guys how to manage your networking. We're also gonna do a video on like how to interview properly, both from a technical standpoint as well as from a behavioral standpoint, mm -hmm. right? But you know, at the end of the day, like recruiting as a non-target student, you guys just need to remember, I think like two big things, right? Like the first thing is that, you know, like the amount of effort you guys put in is the result that you're gonna get back, right? Yeah. Like, and we seriously mean it when we say that we've never seen a non-target kid or any kid from any school yeah. who pits 100% of his or her effort into the recruiting process and not have came out with something. At the end of the day, like recruiting is a competition, right? It's about beating out the other kids. And as a non-target student, you're always at the bottom of the list, right? I remember mm -hmm. when I was doing higher review screenings, right? Like I'm very passionate about non-core schools. And you know, like when I screened over like 90 to 100 higher reviews and I'm like looking at that thing. And then, you know, in the middle of screening my 80th one, I get a message from HR and they're like, hey, by the way, like we already gave out like five offers. And I'm like, oh, what do you mean? Like these non-target interviews hasn't <laughs> even gone out, out yet. Yeah. Yeah. And you guys have already given away like 40, 30, 40% of the spots, yeah. right? And you haven't even hit all your target schools yet. Yeah. Right. So it's like, that's why recruiting is so hard, right? Because you have your relationships with your core schools. You have certain quotas that you need to fill. Mm -hmm. And then like they plug whatever they need left with the non-target students, right? Which is why you guys need to like put a lot of your effort into it. But you know, once you put your effort in, you'll always succeed. Yeah. yeah. And you know, that's why we're here to yeah. help you guys. And you know, always, you know, any, any specific question you have, like feel free to drop below and, we're gonna try to make a video or you know tackle it in you know some of the future videos that we yeah. got coming out. But that said, just drop a like and a subscribe, subscribe. below. Mm -hmm. We see your comments on our three races. We see your love. Sometimes it's difficult for us to make educational content and be goofy at the same time, but we yeah. try our best. And our videos will improve going forward. So thank uh -huh. you a lot for your support, and we'll see you next time. See you. I see what that's it. Yo, touch my nose, bro. Come on.